So this is the, the, the second lecture uh, that we're doing on OLTP indexes. Somebody asked why we're not doing a lecture on OLAP indexes. And the answer is because, uh, as we'll see later in the semester, it's oftentimes uh, faster to do analytical queries on large segments of the database by just reading the data, doing a sequential scan. Right? If it's compressed and stored as a column store, uh, it's going to be really, really fast, especially if, if, you, if, you, if you have to read you know, the entire table. And so for all to be indexes, I mean, this is where you do need to have something that's more fine-grained, where you can come in and do uh, you know, small updates and operations. All right, so for today's agenda, I'm going to start off talking about uh, high-level uh, implementation issues that, you, that we have to worry or be concerned about in a concurrent all to be index. And then we'll spend time talking about how to do uh, about the art index, the radix tree from the hyper guys uh, that was in the paper that you guys read. Um, you guys actually end up reading the, the second art paper. The first one sort of describes the, the, the data structure um, just at, by itself, but it was, a, it was single threaded. It wasn't supporting concurrent operations. So the paper I had you guys read was how do you make the art index current, concurrent? Um, and then we'll finish off. We have extra time. We'll talk about actually how to go about doing profiling. In, in Peloton, like to check for performance and other things. And I would say that this will be in the context of our system because that's what I care about in this course. But the high level ideas are that, that what, I'll, what, you'll, what you'll be able to do using Valgrind and other things are applicable to other systems as well. Okay? All right, so the, we need to talk about now some, some things that are going to come up, uh, or some design decisions that we're going to have to make about how we're actually end up going to implement our index. Right? It's, it's one thing to show you a bunch of pictures and say, like, yeah, this thing talk, you know, has a point to this thing. But when we actually come down time to actually build the index, uh, there are some difficult things we, we have to worry about. So we'll start off talking about how to do memory pools or object pools. Uh, we uh, do garbage collection and then handle non-unique keys, variable length keys, and do prefix compression. So what I'll say is that for all of these here, uh, these are applicable to sort of general purpose trees like a B plus tree, a BW tree, a skip list. Some of these are not applicable to the radix tree, the art, art index. Um, and it's sort of obvious why, because the, how they store their keys are completely different than, than regular tree indexes. Um, but again, I'll say these are, these are, these are high-level constructs or ideas that are applicable to most, most indexes. All right, so the first thing we have to deal with is how we're actually going to allocate memory. So in the diagrams I was showing you, I had like the you know I had these boxes in their skip list and say you know one node in the skip list has a key and a value and a pointer and then you know and, and then you had to have another node to have, have the same you know the same uh, the same data members. The stupidest way to actually implement that would be just to call malloc for every single node anytime I create I need, I need a new node. Um, and this is bad because now we have to go inside of our, the memory allocator. Uh, which is going to have its own internal latch to maintain its own internal data structures and get new memory. And if the allocator doesn't have any, doesn't have any memory, uh, it has to go then down to the kernel and allocate more memory from that, right, to add it to its arenas. So as I said, often in times in this class, the operating system is our frenemy, right? We need it to actually run our database process, but in general, we don't want to talk to it. Uh, so we don't want to be calling malloc and free every single time we want to add a, a simple node, right? And I said that you could combine multiple key value pairs in a single skipless node, uh, and that would reduce the, the number of times you have to call malloc. But in general, still, we don't want to call malloc every single time we have a new node. So the easiest way to, to solve this is to do memory pools or object pools. And the idea here is that if all our nodes under index are the same size, then any time we delete a node, instead of just freeing the memory and giving it back to the allocator, we just put it into this memory pool and then when someone says, I, I need to insert a new node, give me, give me some memory, we just reuse the old one. Right? And this is really easy to do if, if your nodes are fixed length size or a, 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 a small number of fixed length sizes. Right? If it's completely variable length size, then you might just call malloc uh, and go to the allocator and let it figure out how to do it, because there's not, not much you can do else. Right? So get insert, you just grab a free node, otherwise create one, delete, you just add it back. Right? The tricky thing about this, right? So what I've described here is super simple, right? Anybody can implement this. Where things get hard is when you want to actually do compaction or retract the size of your memory pool, 
All right, so think about this. So say you're going to organize your, your memory pool as a, using a hash table. Right? So, so if you're using like Kugel hash table or whatever, like you can grow the hash table pretty, pretty easily. But if now if you need, you need to retract it uh, significantly, you're basically going to have to rehash everything. And that's going to be a very expensive operation. And then the other problem you're going to have is that you're going to have a bunch of holes in your contiguous uh, space of memory. And you need to start now reshuffling things to pack it in so that you can free up a lot of it. So you basically have to reorganize the contents of memory. And that's not cheap. So memory pools are a good idea if, or it's super easy to do if you only get bigger and bigger. Right? But if I insert a billion keys, then delete a billion keys, I don't want my database system to keep around all those nodes for those billion keys that don't exist anymore. Right? And you may say, well, well, how often does this happen? It's actually pretty common. A lot of times you see in, um, in O2B applications, you'll see things where they will insert a bunch of data throughout the day, and then they offload it to an analytical system, like a separate database system, to do all their machine learning or complex decision support queries on a separate machine, and they just delete or prune everything from, their, from the front-end system. So that when the, the next morning starts, they they're essentially have an empty database or a smaller database, and they just insert a bunch more stuff into it. So it's very common to have things getting bigger and larger, um, and so retracting it is 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 not not trivial. Okay, so this is something you should definitely do in in your skip list. Uh, this is easy. You should definitely do this. This is harder. Let's see how far you get. Okay. So the next thing we got to deal with is is garbage collection. So, and this is, again, this is, this is separate from the memory pool, right? This is, this is how we can decide whether it's actually, we're, it's okay for us to delete a node or an object in our index and then give it back to the memory pool, right? And, and the, the, the issue we're trying to deal with is that because if we have all these pointers pointing to our different nodes and it's not just continuous space of memory, uh, we could have a thread that's hanging out on this node here and it has a pointer to go to K3 and wants to scan across. But then some other thread decides, all right, I've deleted K, K3. I can go ahead and remove this entirely from memory. right? I did a physical deletion after I logically deleted it. But now this, this thread is going to scan along this pointer and land in, in no man's land right? and get a seg fault because you're, you're accessing now gar garbage in memory. Right? So our garbage collector needs to be mindful of what threads are active in our, in our index and make sure that uh, there's nobody could be accessing memory we're actually about to free up, right? It could also be the case, too, if, if, we're, if we're using a memory pool, I go ahead and delete this, and now I put in, you know, K12, some other key, because I reused that, me that memory, and now I scan across and I find this, and I, I, I think everything's okay, because I landed a memory. It looks like a node in my index, but it's actually not logically correct, right? So it's not just dealing with physical deletes and where you have, could have seg faults, it's also just, you know, reading data that you shouldn't be able to read. So there are, um, if you've taken 418, 618, or any, any uh, sort of concurrent programming course, uh, they'll talk about a bunch of these different methods, right? The two that we're going to care about are, are reference counting and epoch-based reclamation. There's also hazard pointers and other things you can use, but in general, this is what uh, most people use in, in a database system. So with a reference counter, the basic idea is that we're going to keep track on every single node or object in our index. We'll just maintain a counter that says, the number of threads that are currently accessing it. So if I'm a thread comes along and I, and I want to read this node, I'll do a compare, uh, atomic addition, a compare and swap on its counter and add one to it. So that just tells now everyone else that I'm a thread. They don't need, uh, there is a thread. They don't need to know which one it is. They just know that there is one. There is a thread that's accessing this node and therefore it's, it's not safe to delete it. And then when we're done doing whatever, whatever it is that we need to do, then we go ahead and can decorate that counter and then when a thread says, I, I want to delete this object, delete this node, because it's, the key's been removed, we know it's only safe to delete that, that node when that count is zero. All right? Now, again, this is super simple to implement. Uh, but you're going to have that same problem that we saw before when we talked about spin locks. Right? Because now you're basically going to have some nodes, some object sitting in memory and all your cores running on different sockets are doing compare and swap or atomic add to flip its counter up and down. So that's going to generate a lot of cache coherence traffic to invalidate that, that location in memory just to flip this counter and to say, hey, I've, I've, I'm done accessing this. Right? So this, this is technically sound and correct, 
we will not have dangling pointers, we will not have uh, deletion, a physical deletion of objects before they actually should be, but it's going to get bad performance because it's essentially writing just shared memory. And as we saw on the silo paper, we, we don't want to do that. So there's two things we can point out here uh, and how we can come up with a better version. So the first thing is that uh, we actually don't care in the case of reference counting, we don't actually care what the value of that counter is. Right? As long as I know that it's not zero, I don't care. Right? I don't need to know exactly. So it's not that super important that every thread adds one to this counter. We just need to know that there's somebody there. Right? The other thing, too, is that uh, this is sort of more from an implementation standpoint. Just because the counter goes to zero doesn't mean at that exact moment in time we need to free up that memory and reuse it. Now, the reason why I say this is sort of implementation detail because it depends on how you implement garbage collector collection in, in your index. So in the case of, um, uh, you know, in the BW tree, you could do it with this epoch thing and, it, and have a separate background thread to lay things up. Or actually, as we described in MVCC, you could have a dedicated background thread, do vacuuming and clean up the objects. Or you could do a cooperative cleaning where some thread recognizes, all right, well, there's nobody else could be accessing this object. It's time for me to go ahead and delete this. Uh, either one doesn't matter. Uh, either one is is okay. It's just that we don't when, when we design our garbage collection doesn't you don't have to think like okay I immediately have to delete this once I know the counter is zero or once I know nobody could access it, right? Um, in the case of our implementation of the BW tree in Peloton, we do cooperative garbage collection in, inside of the BW tree, but we don't do this for performance reasons or any sound reasons. We do this for stupid software engineering reasons, uh, which I can take offline, right? All right, so let's see how to do this, let's see how to do this better. So the epoch-based garbage collection is what we, you read about in the uh, in the BW tree paper, and the basic idea is that there's some global epoch counter that's periodically updated, right? You can do it every 10 milliseconds. In the silo paper, they did it every 40 milliseconds, and then what will happen is that any time a thread enters the index to do something, like some operation, insert, delete, uh, or look up, that they're going to update some uh, Global epoch manager to say I'm thread I'm a thread that that's entering this index at this at this epoch whatever the current epoch is, and the idea is that you do whatever you, your thread does whatever operation needs to do and then when it's done then it goes and removes itself from from the epoch that that it entered in, right? And then what happens is if you if your thread makes a change where it says all right there's this node that I can now delete uh, I've logically deleted and therefore it should be it should be garbage collected at some point. You mark that node in the epoch garbage collector to say this node was deleted at this epoch, and then the the, the garbage collection mechanism or, or component can then reclaim that 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 node once it knows that the no other thread exists in the current epoch or any epoch came prior to it. All right. So say I'm doing epochs every 10 milliseconds. So for whatever reason, I have one thread enter at epoch one, but it takes 20 milliseconds to do whatever it wants to do. Right. Uh, so the, uh, he's in, he comes in epoch one, then in epoch two we switch over. Another thread comes in and he deletes something, and then uh, at at epoch three, there's no thread in epoch two, but there is a thread in epoch one, and therefore it could still see that node that got deleted because you don't know what what pointer it's looking at that could jump to that location of memory, so we can't delete it. So even though there wasn't anybody in epoch two anymore, there is still somebody in epoch one. And we have to wait for him to complete. So that's what it means by all preceding epochs, right? So this is what you're going to want to implement in Project Two. Uh, there's a bunch of literature online how to do this. If you're outside the context of databases, it'll be called recopy update or RCU. This is what's used in uh, the Linux kernel for their how they do internal garbage collection for for their data structures, right? In general, this it is uh, conventional wisdom. That, or the current science says that this is the best approach to do this for in-memory index. All right, so let's talk about how to do other things. So it's how to handle non-unique indexes. So in in any intro database class, right, we teach you about B plus trees, and we talk about you know here's a key and value. Here's you just insert it, right, and there's these arrays where you store the keys and the values, and then things are super easy, right, uh, and that assumes that you're dealing with unique indexes or primary key indexes. But now if you had to support non-unique indexes where you could have duplicate keys, things get a little bit tricky. 
So there's this great book, which is available online uh, from the Gertz Graffy, the guy that wrote the, the paper you guys read about locking and latching and indexes. Right? He wrote a paper, a book in 2010 called Modern Vitree Techniques. So a lot of things I'm talking about here are, come from this. And this is, I find this thing really fascinating. It's definitely a good read. All right, so the, the, the two ways we can handle non-unique indexes are either to just store duplicate keys and just have uh, you know, the additional values that we, that we need to have for you know, our pointers to different tuples, or we can only st store the key once and then just have a linked list of all the unique values that correspond to that key. So let's, let's look at an example, right? So, so we're not doing skip lists, let's do B, B plus trees because again, that's the easiest to understand for this. So there's a bunch of metadata at the top you need to have in your page for a B plus tree. For our purposes, we don't care. Um, so here we see that we have a sorted array for the keys and, and their values. In the case of key one, we see that it's duplicated three times. And then whatever offset you are in, the, uh, in this array, uh, that corresponds to the value that points to the tuple that corresponds to this key instance, right? So if you're at the third key instance here, you, you jump to the third offset in the value list and that gives you your array, right? This is pretty simple to implement. implement. Uh, the tricky thing, of course, is that any, when you want to delete a key, you actually have to always pass in the pointer or the value to it because you, you need to know which instance you're actually deleting because otherwise you just delete all, all of key one. The alternative approach is to have the key sorted right, and, uh, in, in a separate array, and every key only appears once. And then the, there's an indirection layer that says, if you want key one, it's in the first position, and that points to some linked list or some li uh, array data structure here that'll give you all the values that correspond to, to that single key. Right? Uh, is my, my, from what I can tell, the, this approach, the duplicate keys, is, is, is the most common one. Because this doesn't require any change to your actual uh, data structure. Right? Whether you're sorting unique keys or non-unique keys, you don't have to have you know, a separate list of, and, and like this. So most systems implement it, implement it this way. And this is, this is actually what we do as well. All right, so the next thing we got to deal with are variable length keys. And again, like in the intro class, we make it super easy. You say, oh yeah, everything's a 64-bit integer. You don't care about uh, dealing with things of variable length. But you know, it's oftentimes people, in, you know, people index on strings all the time, so we have to deal with that. So it's essentially four approaches. The, and I was to say, the, the, it's really only the last one that is, is, is what people use. This is the real one. But just to show you that there are other ways to do this, although they're not good. Um, so the first approach would be essentially do the same thing that we did in T-trees, where we don't actually store the key in the index. We just store a pointer to the tuple, and then we can find the key. So this is nice, because now our pointers are always 64 bits. They're now fixed to length, and we don't have to do anything special. But as we said before, uh, you're going to pay a big cache, your cache uh, locality hit because every single time I need to do a comparison of a key with the thing I'm trying to probe on, I got to go look up the tuple, bring that into my CPU cache, and then do the comparison. So nobody does this. The other approach is to support variable length key, uh, index, or variable length <coughs> nodes. And this basically allows you to have um, just the, the size of each node can be different lengths. Uh, but then this is the problem we talked about before when you have object pools, because now it's, you can't reuse objects very easily, right? So nobody does this. The other approach is maybe to do padding. So if I'm trying to do an index on a varchar32 and I, and I put a 16 character string into it, I'll just pad it out or add in the extra space where it should be if it was up to 32, 32 uh, characters. Um, and I just need to know that when, what the length actually is, so when I do comparison, I can ignore you know, those nulls or, or the spaces. Right? And nobody does this because this is actually wasteful because if, you know, oftentimes people declare you know, varchar 1024 when they only want to store two characters. And so you'd be wasting a ton of space to do this. What people instead do is to have either a key map or indirection layer that's going to allow us to embed basically a list of pointers that, that are going to map to some offset in our node or our, or our page of where the actual key is, is stored. All right, so say like this. So I have my key map, and again, these are all gonna be uh, fixed length offsets into my page. And then down below here, I have my keys and, keys and values. Right, so if, I, if, I'm, if I'm looking for the first key, I follow this pointer, and there, there's my, then there's the offset. 
and now I can do whatever comparison I want to do. So the key map will be sorted in the, uh, in the lexicographical order that's defined by the keys. But the actual keys, how they're laid out in memory, these can be in any order that you want. Right? Because what will happen is, as you delete keys, you want to, you know, you want to be able to reuse the, these slots and, uh, the, and without having to always depend to the bottom. So Obama might get deleted, and for better or worse, you would have to insert Trump here, right? And so we'd want to keep this sorted such that Prashant appears before Trump, but in actual physical memory, Trump would, would appear first, right? And so it's sort of like a you know, bin packing problem, trying to figure out how to fill in the holes as you delete things. Yes? So how is this different from using pointers and keys? His question is, how is this different using pointers and keys? So the difference is that this is a single page. So I'm going to go have a single page, and it's, it's not going to be a far jump for me to get this. I'll, I'll get to, you actually bring up a very good point, but it's very likely that like, I can bring this all in and, and with the Harvard prefetcher, because I know I'm going to scan everything. Uh, you know, because this is essentially just a byte array. It sort of looks like I'm describing it as like, an, like a, a Java object with these data members. It's just a byte array. So I go fetch this, and the Harvard prefetcher can bring in everything else because it's all contiguous. Whereas in the case of the T tree model, I'm jumping to some random location in memory, and the Harvard prefetcher doesn't know anything about that, right? Are these and, just offsets then, or are they yeah, these are just like these are, could be like you know, eight bit offsets or sixteen bit offsets, right? Because you're just jumping within the same page. Let's say if you uh, want to search for Andy, and you have to like go to the directional layer and then follow the offset. Right. So his statement is, if I want to do a lookup on Andy, I basically have to look in this key map, and it's you could you you could do binary search because this is sorted. So you could say take the middle guy, you would land here and it's Obama. Andy is less than Obama, so I would know that this is the one I want to go to. You don't have to do a linear scan. Every, every time you have to, like, have to addition. Yes, so thank you. So he's like, every single time you have to have this indirection jump on here. So a very common technique is just to add the a prefix up here in the key map, like this. So now when I say I want to look up Andy, I could do a binary search, look for Obama. A is less than O, so then I don't want to go here, and then poof, there's the thing I want. Right? So I had to do one, one less indirection to make that happen. And I can do this very quickly because this is all going to be my CPU caches. Yes? Is this still wasteful though? Because like now the page needs to be like how many, how, how many key values the node can store times like the maximum size, but it still wants to be able to store all the values. So your, your statement is... Um, like you describe it as allocating into one array, right? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, th th this node is a single byte array. Right. Doesn't that byte array need to be like big enough to like fit all, like, the maximum amount of values that can fit in one node times, like, what the maximum size of that value is. So, like, if you're storing, like, bar chart as 1024, don't you need to allocate enough space to fit a final node? Yes. So his statement is, um, his statement is, uh, do I need to allocate space to accommodate what I think is going to be, the could possibly be the largest key I could insert? Typically, no, you don't do that. If it's a char, then yes, you have to allocate it because everything is always going to be that exact size. If it's a var char, then it's going to be variable length, and you just you just allocate as you need. Now, if I get too big, if it gets to the case where like I insert something in between Andy and Obama, and that's like the 1024, and now I can't fit this all in a single node, then I have to split the node, right? Uh, and how you do that is. Um, it depends on the index for a B plus tree. You just have a pointer to like an overflow chain, right? Because you're not sort of chain. Well, you're not logically splitting it. Sort of. You could, you could, but you could establish an overflow chain. Both both approaches work. It makes sense to like put them in a node for like this discovering the databases, but in terms of like in-memory databases. Do they have to be like in a single So your question is, um, so your statement is, uh, in a disk-based database, disk-based, disk-oriented database, they will organize in, in terms of pages. So everything's all packed in. Yeah. But the in-memory database, would it still be organized as a page or a node like this? No. So in memory databases, does it, like, uh, do we have to necessarily keep key map and key plus values in a single node? So that we can 
Oh, so his statement is, does it have to be the key map and the key values be put together in a single node? No, but from sort of from a software engineering standpoint, right now you got some some chunk of memory here that's your key value map, and right, and then your, your key map over here, right? To 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 coordinate all that would be a big pain, right? So you just have a single node. It's a byte array. You know the boundary. You know the size, and you know what you can put in it, right? In the back. But then every time you insert something into the key map, the object for the map, the values will change, right? So his, his statement is: every single time I insert something into the key map, would the offset change? Yeah. Why would it change? I mean, if it's in the same node and it's in contiguous space. Right. So say again. So say I want to insert um, Trump down here. Let's pick somebody better than Trump. Um, um, Tupac, thank you. Yes, excellent. All right, we want to start Tupac. Tupac's dead though, but all right. Okay. We want to start Tupac down here, right? I just a better example because because that we just append here. Um, uh, somebody between A and O, um, Gandhi, right? We want to start Gandhi. Gandhi would be Gandhi logically should be between A and O, but we can assert him down here, assuming we have free memory, and then we just reshuffle this. This key map, because this is like this has to be in sort of order based on the keys, but these do not. That is your question. Okay. All right. Uh, so the last thing is how to deal with compression. So we'll talk about database compression later in uh, in, in a few more classes, um, and that's like compressing the actual tuples themselves. Um, there are ways to compress indexes. This is one of them. We'll, we'll talk about another way. Um, but the, there's two observations we can make on how we can compress the, the amount of data we have to store. So the first is, is to do uh, in the inner nodes, where we can reduce the number of, the, reduce the size of the key uh, that we need to have or maintain in our inner nodes for us to figure out whether we need to go left or right or route probes and searches to go in the right direction. So in this case here, I have A through K as one key, and then L through V as another key. But we know that these two keys are pretty distinct So I actually, you know, already, so I don't need to store the, the entire key sequence. So instead of storing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to K, I can just store A, B, C for, for the first guy and L and N for the second one. And that's enough to still be able to allow us to figure out whether we want to go left and right. And we can get away with this because, remember, in the B plus tree, these are just copies of keys. The real keys we have to store down here, so we'd have to store that, that entire thing to do the correct comparison. But up here, we don't have to do this. So we can cut down, cut down on the space. The optimization we can do now down in the leaf nodes is to recognize that since our keys are going to be sorted in lexicographical order, uh, in general, there's going to be a lot of overlap between the first couple characters or first couple of digits in the, our key. Right? So say in this leaf node here, I have Andre, Andy, and Anne, Annie. Well, we can recognize that AN is the first two characters of all these three keys. So I can just have a little uh, prefix thing that says AN, and then just the unique portions of those keys uh, stored in the actual key slots. And so, I need to, so when I come down, I would know, all right, if I want to actually look up and see whether Andy exists, i got to take the prefix and, and, and put it in front of the DY, and that can reconstruct my original key. Right? You can actually do this also for, um, for uh, uh, the actual record IDs as well. Right? If you can recognize that the first couple of digits of your record ID is the same, because they're in the same page, for example, then you can do that same kind of deduplication. So this is, this is also very common as well. Um, compression often isn't used widely in a in memory database system for OTP applications because the um, the overhead is 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 often deemed not worth it. But I would say prefix compression compression is 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 pretty common. Okay. All right. So the reason why I wanted to start off with this is and this with this sort of these 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 techniques because then we can see now how in the context of uh, of the art index a lot of this actually doesn't matter anymore. Um, the garbage collection does, the memory pool stuff does, but the, the, the prefix stuff, not so much, because the way they're going to organize the, the keys themselves is, is draft, draft, 
drastically different. So the uh, adaptive rate extreme, or the art index, is the default index you get from uh, in hyper now. Uh, I think they originally were using a B plus tree or red black tree, and then they switched to, to, the, to the rate X tree, the R tree. So the basic idea is that instead of storing the complete copies of keys at different nodes, they're only going to store the single digits or, or subsequence of the digits in the in the key. And by digit, I don't mean like a single Arabic numeral. I mean like one character in a string or one bit in, in an integer. And then what's gonna, what this is going to allow them to do is do one by one uh, comparison of these digits as you traverse the tree, rather than having to do a complete comparison of the, of the entire key. And so the rate of trees have some really interesting properties that are much different than everything we've seen in the skip list, the B plus tree, and the BW tree. So the first is that. The, the height of the tree is going to depend on not the number of keys we have, but actually the length of the keys. So if I have a B plus tree, uh, I could have a, um, I could have a, a, if I have a, you know, a, a tree with 10 keys versus 10 million keys, the 10 million key tree is going to be much, much taller, have a greater height. In the radix tree, I could have 10 keys that have the length of, of, you know, of a million or something like that, and that would be the, the height of the tree. The other interesting thing is that it's not going to require any rebalancing, right? We don't have to do splits and merges as we ch as we change uh, change our index. Um, and then because we're not actually storing the full key in the index, or actually storing it in its full form, right? Uh, and the way we have to reconstruct the key is actually by traversing the index itself. So the paths from the root to the leaf are actually how you regenerate the keys. And this is why we don't provide you guys a sort of dump key function or a nice pretty printer for your, for your skip list or your index, because we support the radix tree or the art index in, in Peloton, and you'd have to do basically breath, breath first traversal to reproduce, reproduce all those keys. Now we could do that, we just haven't done it, but there's no sort of, um, there, you know, there, there wasn't a, a quick way for, for us to do this, so we, we don't provide that method. And again, sort of related to this is that the keys are now stored implicitly inside the pass inside the, the tree itself, uh, rather than having the complete copy of it. So as a quick show of hands, uh, who here is know, knows what a try is, or has heard of a try before? All right, good, a lot of people. Who here knows what a radix tree is? Or heard before you guys read the paper? Maybe that's a better way to ask it. So who here has heard of the radix tree before you read the paper? Two in the back, three, four, okay, good. Well, you, you hang out with me, so that's fine. All right. So a radix tree is sometimes called a, a digit, sorry, digit tree, um, but it's a variant of, a, of what's called a tri, right? So a tri was discovered, I think, in like 1959 by some French dude. Um, and then in like two years later or so, actually this guy, Edward Fenkin, he then coined the term tri uh, as a way to distinguish it from a, like a tree. Um, the term try is, is, comes from the term retrieval tree. Right? That, that's sort of what it's supposed to mean. Um, the, the Edward Fenkin, apparently he's still faculty at CMU, but he lives in Boston. I've never met him, but <laughs> supposedly he's, on, you know, he's here. Uh, that's fine. All right, so this is a try. Um, so we're going to store three keys, hello, hat, and have. And what we're going to do is we're going to break up the digits, like the single characters in our key, and those are going to be represented in, in, in the index and the tree structure. And anytime we have an overlap between the same character at the same position for different keys, they'll be able to reuse that character. So in the case of hello, right, or these three keys here, they all start with H, so H is at the root. But then hello has E-L-L-O, -L -L -O, which is distinct from hat and have. So it has its own path in the tree where you can see it's H-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. Right? And then the, at the bottom, you would have a pointer to the, to the tuple that it belongs to. In the case of hat and have, they both share the character A in the second position. So as you come down the path here, they reuse that, but then they split off between VE and T for the two different, uh, two different keys. So our radix tree is just a compressed form of this. It's the same idea, but now what happens is anytime that you have a path that is not shared with anybody else, then you, you, you don't have to have every single individual nodes. You just only have the, the, single, the single node that corresponds to the unique part. So again, all three keys start with the letter H. 
So that's at the root. And then for hello, ELO, it's stored separately in this node, right, in its complete form. Right? I don't need to have a separate node with a pointer all the way down. So this is a radix tree, right? I think also sometimes it's called a Patricia tree, but in, in practice it's always called this. Or, or it's always called a radix tree. Um, so now what makes art different is that just like in the skip list where I showed you guys sort of a, a high level diagram like this, where you have these edges and these nodes and things like that, this is not how actually you want to store it in a real, in memory for real in a real system, right? So what art con contributes is that it's showing you how you could represent a radix tree in an efficient form in a way that's designed for modern CPU processor and mo mo modern architectures. And so what they're going to do is they're going to allow the, 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 the adaptive part of the, of the art index is that it's going to be able to support different node types based on how the keys get inserted and how things get restructured. So the cool thing about radix trees also too is that the layout of the index or the layout of the tree is deterministic. Meaning if I always have the same set of keys, no matter what order I insert those keys and with how many different threads, I always end up with the same the same st structure. Whereas like in a B plus tree or BW tree or a skip list, uh, if I have different, uh, different threads inserting things at different times, I may be doing splits and mergers in different ways than if I run it the second time with a different number of threads. But in a radix tree, it's always going to be exactly the same. So they can define these rules that allow you to decide when do you want to split and merge your, your, your nodes in the radix tree and then the idea is that you want to try to pack in together as many digits as possible uh, to maximize your cache locality, right? So again, it's just like before, he was asking, what if, well, could I store the key map and the value list in separate locations in memory? Uh, in practice, yes, but you want things, things that are being used together often, you want to be close together. And not, ha not have to do all these separate fetches. So that, this is how you would actually represent uh, the same three keys that I showed before inside of an art index. So the first thing you see is that uh, at the second level, this is the same contiguous block of memory, a single node, but it's going to have the, the, the digits for ELO and then the digit for A down here. And the same thing for hat and have, VE and T are stored in the same contiguous node, right? So now let's say I want to insert the key here. Uh, so it would go here, go, we would put it here because they both share uh, H and A, but the IR part is separate. So I have space in here, I can go ahead and insert it. So I don't have to allocate anything to do this. I don't have to re reorganize anything. I have space, I'm, I'm, I'm able to put it right in there. right? And that's done very efficiently. But now say I want to delete hat and have. Well, we want to blow this away. And again, now the art index specifies that there's rules to say, all right, this thing is 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 now um, a single path down by itself. So I want to collapse it and put this up in here. And so the only modification I need to make is really for the node that I was modifying and then my parent. I don't need to you know go all the way up in the tree and condense everything. So they talk about having different node sizes where you can allocate um, uh, you know the, the most amount of memory you, you possibly could think you would need. Um, and it's sort of packed in a way that, again, that, that, that's, that minimizes the amount of indirection you would have in your index. So the one really cool thing I like about art also is uh, it talks about how to actually represent any possible data type or attribute type you could have in your database in a rate extreme. So the, the, in the examples I was showing before, I was showing all var chars. So it's really obvious to see how you just take every character and that's sort of considered a, a node going down or as part of your path in the tree. But when you want to take other you know, binary values, integers, floats, and other things, you can't actually do that. Or at least you can't do this easily on, on Intel CPUs. So Intel CPUs are a little endian. So that means that the, 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 the least significant bit is always going to be on, on, on one side. So if we took the little endian representation of an integer and, and stored it in our index going down, we would end up trying to compare the least significant bit, which is not exactly what you want to do. You, you end up with false negatives and false positives. So I'll, I'll show an example of what I mean by this in a second. But basically what they say is that to make the radix tree work on Intel CPUs, 
you have to do a little extra work to flip around binary values to make them be representable in a, in a, in a try. So the easiest one to think about is unsigned integers, right? Right again, uh, Intel CPUs are a little endian. We need to make them big endian. So we just flip the bits, and then we can store the digits down. Um, for signed integers, you've got to be a little careful. We've got to flip the two complements. So this ensures that always the negative numbers are smaller than the positive numbers. Because again, because otherwise, if you're going in little endian order, you wouldn't know that until you hit the, the, the bit at the end that says whether it's negative or not. For floats, uh, this is a little more complicated. You basically classify the floating point number to based on whether it's negative or positive or normalized, denormalized, and then you try to store it as a, or you, you do store it as the unsized, unsigned fixed point integer uh, in big endian order. For compound keys, uh, you basically do the, the transformation for every single element of the key, and then you just reverse everything. So let's look at an example, because I realize me making this hand gesture does not 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 help explain it, right? <laughs> All right. So here's the integer key, right? So assume it's unsigned. So it's you know 168 million. So if we represent this as hex. Uh, we have we have you know these hex sequences here. So if we store it as as little endian as you would in the uh, in Intel, you would see that the first entry corresponds to the least significant bit over here. But big endian, it's flipped, so you would have the 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 most significant bit. Start, start at the top, which is what we want. So we need to flip this to put it into big endian form, and then we can store it now in our, our index, or in our tree, right? Because now when we want to do a lookup, we would start here and do, do a mem compare on this value with the, whatever we're trying to probe against, and then this is going to allow us to determine right away whether, you know, if, if we're checking to see whether less than or greater than, we would know at that point, you know, uh, whether we want to go left or right, or whether we actually have a match. Right, because otherwise we're starting with like you know, you know this part here of the, of the of the value and trying to compare that, and we wouldn't know later on to whether actually we're, we're greater than or less than, right? So let's say I wanted to do a lookup on uh, like this, right, sixty-five thousand or six hundred fifty thousand, right? The hex would be like this. If I'm in little endian form, then I'm comparing the hex code one uh, d with zero d. One d is greater than zero d. So I would think that this number is greater than this number when, when it's not. Right? So that's why they have to put everything into big ending. So we actually do this in Peloton as well. Um, you'll see this when you, when you start building your skip list. Right? You'll call the index, index factory uh, class, and you say, make me, make me a skip list. And you'll see that it'll instantiate things like uh, compact, they'll have different parameters for the templates, like Compact sim key or generic key or tuple key, right? These are how we represent keys in our index. And so our compact integers key is like essentially this doing the same kind of binary comparison that the uh, that, that the, the the radix tree, the art index, is actually doing. And so this is a little simple micro benchmark I wrote last year where I inserted or did a lookup, insert, delete, insert, lookup, or delete uh, 10 million integer keys. And I store them as the different in their different forms. So generic key is basically like take the raw bytes and then wrap it around a value object and, and do a comparison uh, whenever you, you as you traverse the index. And then I wrote a faster version to do a comparison called fast compare, where basically instead of copying the bytes to do a comparison and cre or creating the value object, I just go directly to the pointer and do do my comparison. But it's still just doing like the like the you know, the Intel instructions to do the direct comparison rather than trying to pack many bits together and do, doing a fast comparison like that. So what you see again, the, 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 the compact integer uh, key representation and comparison is, uh, is you know, four times, five times as faster as the uh, as generic compare. So this is like the same data structure, same data, di just different ways to represent the, the, the actual keys themselves and do the comparison. And then the, the binary comparison that art does is much faster. So as I said before, the last class was uh, about latch free indexes. So the way to think about these last the last three lectures are we talk about index and latching and latching from like the tradition traditional sense. Then we said, oh, well, people think you want to build latch free indexes, so let's get rid of all that and let's do a skip list or BW tree. And now we're doing uh, we're bringing back the latches and saying, well, if you actually use a different data structure, 
you can get better performance while still using latches. So art is not latch free. Um, and the paper you guys read, they talk about how it would be a significant amount of engineering work for them to retrofit the index and make, actually make it uh, latch free. Right? You essentially have to bring in like the mapping table and uh, possibly delta records that we saw on the BW tree, or have it limited. Um, you know, uh, in case you get, well, I don't want to do skip list, but bottom line is they say it's, it's, it's hard to do, and they didn't do it. So instead, they they propose two different ways to do a concurrent index that is not as bad as traditional latch crabbing that we saw with the, the B plus tree. So they have optimistic lock coupling, which is the one we'll spend most time on. And then they talk about a little bit about this read optimized write exclusion. Um, the optimistic lock coupling is easy to understand and can be easily applied to uh, you know, any possible data structure. The read optimized write exclusion is, is requires a major change to your data structure to be able to do this, to support the kind of techniques that they want. They describe how to do it in an art index, but you could potentially do it in the same thing in a, in a B plus tree. Okay, so the the lock the latch crabbing scheme that we talked about before uh, was sort of a, a pessimistic approach in that you assume that you're going to have problems as you go down, so you acquire latches on your way, right? And if, whether you're a reader or a writer. But with optimistic latch crabbing is that the the writers are never going to get blocked on the readers, and it's up for the readers to figure out whether they read something that is no longer valid anymore. And you have to do this check before you're allowed to proceed to the next node or element in the tree. For this discussion, we won't do it in R, we'll do it in the B plus tree because that's, that's easier to understand. Um, but basically what happens is now every single node in the, in the index is going to have a version number. If you're a writer and you're modifying that node, you basically make your change uh, or acquire a latch on it, make the change, and then increment that counter. And then now the other threads can figure out whether they've in the past they read the correct version they showed up. So let's look at an example here. So this is that same sort of simple B plus tree that we had before, but now we're going to introduce version numbers for every single node. So now if I want to do a search on key 44, uh, if I'm a reader thread, I would start off here in the root, and I don't require any latches to go down. All I have to do is just check to see what, you know, record the version number that I read, uh, do whatever it is, you know, look up I want inside my node to figure out what, whether I want to go left or right. And in this case here, assume we want to go down, so we'll go down here. But now, uh, and I'll, I'll read this version, but now before I'm allowed to, to actually proceed and say, yes, I, I followed the correct path, I got to go back and check to see whether the, the node I just came from, whether its version is still version 3. If it is, then I know that nobody actually changed anything. If it's not, then I know that somebody did change something, and the, the thing that I'm at now may not actually still be valid. Maybe another node here that I should have followed to get to. Get to. Again, this is why we have this epoch-based garbage collector, because I'm down in here. Technically, I shouldn't be able to get to this. This thing's been marked as deleted, but I don't want anybody to physically delete it because I'm still looking at it. Right? So we do this in the context of epoch-based garbage collection. We won't have the problem that we're now in, you know, in, in, in reading invalid memory. So assume this case here, v3 was still the correct version we read. Then we now can do whatever lookup we needed in this search, on this node, figure out we need to go down here, read this version number, go check to make sure that this thing is the same version, and then now we're able to do our traversal here. Right? And the same thing, once we're done reading 44, we go check to see whether we read the same version. If so, then we know that we had a consistent view of the index on our way down, and then nobody, nobody modified anything. All right? Super easy to understand. I really like this. So let's look at an example now of when we have a writer in, in, in the mix. Right? So let's go back and say that before we actually... Uh, uh, if we're able to finish checking that we're, we're at v5, some other thread comes along, right? It, 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 it came down here, and then it's going to modify something here that's going to cause us to modify this node here. So what will happen is it has to require a, a, a latch on this, on this node because that prevents other writers from modifying at the same time, but the readers don't check for this, so that's, that's fine. And then after it's, make, it's done making its change, it increments the version number to now be v6, so what will happen is when this thread goes back and checks and say, did I read the right version? It'll say, well, v5 is not the same as v6, so somebody modifies something, so therefore I, I'm invalid. I have to abort my operation and come back and retry. 
So one downside of this is that it may lead to um, uh, false aborts or un unnecessary ab aborts because it may be the case that when this thread made this mod modified this node here, it just modified what this thing pointed to. It didn't modify what, what this thing was pointing to. So technically, the thread that got, got killed, he's fine. He did, he did the right thing. But because these, these version numbers are so coarse-grained, right, it's on the per-node basis, any modification to that node would affect the entire thing. Right, so any thread that, that read that would have to fail. So the alternative is the read-optimized read exclusion where the idea here is that we're not going to have the writers interfere with the readers. The readers are always going to be able to proceed. And it's only the writers have to acquire uh, locks to, to present them, prevent other writers from making changes. And essentially, this is sort of like doing like shadow paging or, or, or like sort of multi-versioning, where the writers will create new versions in, in an atomic way, such that the changes become uh, visible to readers all at once without you having to, 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 without you having to block everyone else and without you reading inconsistent data. So again, this requires a complete change to how the data structure actually works. In the case of the paper, they talk about how you, you know, reorganize your atomics when you update pointers and offsets in each node. Um, in the case of B plus trees, you essentially do a copy and write scheme. And you do it can do atomic installation of the of, of new new nodes. So again, I don't want to get into details of this because we're short on time, but like the basic idea here is that you have to make fundamental changes to how threads modify the data structure in order to make this, this scheme work. Okay. So this is the same graph now that I that I showed you last class. Uh, and this this again, this puts everything all now that we talked about in perspective here. So the the, the B plus tree and the, the, the art index here, this is with optimistic lock coupling. The mass tree does something similar to what Cicada does, but not exactly the same. Um, but the mass tree is basically a tree of tries or tri trees. It's one of the two, right? Uh, but it's basically a hybrid data structure, a combination of, of B plus trees and tries. So it's sort of it's similar to the, the radix tree, but it's not a pure try. So again, this is just showing you that in the case of the, with optimistic lock coupling um, on the, with the B plus tree, it can often outperform the, 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 the BW tree. It crushes the skip list. Again, oh shit, I forgot to check that. I think that's wrong. Um, yeah, I think those two numbers should be flipped. Um, yeah, the B plus tree should be faster. Uh, but the art index, even though it's using locking, it's beating all these lat tree data structures, right? And again, the main takeaway here is that if you organize your keys and you fast key comparison, if your data structure can support efficient operations, even though you're doing locking, the overhead of that is, 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 not, is, is, is not detrimental to performance, especially in a multi-core environment, right? So, the main thing, the thing to point out is I basically was wrong about the BW tree. This is a two-year process for me. I'm still in recovery trying to deal with uh, this loss. Um, but again, I was super sold on the BW tree. The paper really clicked for me. It said, this is exactly how you want to build a latch tree index. But the science has, has, has borne out that that's actually not the, the right way to go. And I'm not saying the art index is the, the end-all to be-all, but I think there's ideas from a radix tree and certainly they're, they're applied to the mastery that are better for OLTP workloads. Yes? Why the BW tree is slow? Yep. Yeah, I, I have a graph, but I, it's in the paper, but I didn't have any time to show it. Right? It's everything. The mapping table, the delta chain, replying the delta records. It's just, you're just doing more work to deal with the fact that you're, la you're lock free, latch free. And that the fact that you're lock free doesn't actually gain you that much? It doesn't gain you that much. Carefully. Correct, yes. Yeah, so his point was, is the fact that your lat tree for an in-memory index, is that superseded by a index that is just using locks more carefully? Yes. All right, so in the, the last few minutes of the class, um, I want to do sort of a quick crash course on how to do profiling. Right? Again, this is not in the context, or this is, is in the context of Peloton, 
but these ideas are applicable to, to, to really any systems. All right, so let's say that we have a program here, uh, and the program has two functions, foo and bar. So, and our program's running slow, so we've got to figure out how, to, how we want to speed it up. So the mo most naive thing to do, like the dumbest thing to do, is just we run our program in, in our favorite debugger, like GDB, and basically every so often we just pause the, the program, spit out the back tra the, the backtrace or the stack trace of where it's executing, and record what, you know, what, what functions we're in. And we just do this every so often and then maintain, you know, figure out this table and say, well, what, you know, where are we spending most of our time? So that's a dumb way. We'll see how to do this better. But let's say we do this, right? And then we find out that uh, of the 10 call track samples we've collected, we find out that six of them, six of the 10 times were in foo. So that means that we know that 60% of our time, based on our sample, 60% uh, of our time is spent in the, in the function foo. Right? And of course, obviously, if we can do this, we have like a little robot hit and pause over and over again, uh, we can get more samples and have more accurate uh, measurement. But for our purposes, we find out 60% you know, is in foo, so that's what we want to look at. So now we're going to figure out how we want to optimize our system, what kind of benefit we would we'd want it to expect. Right? And the idea here is we want to avoid premature op optimization. We don't want to just pick, oh, I want to optimize this piece of code because it's, it's, being, it's written in a real stupid way. But if that piece of code is barely ever called, then you're basically not, you're not going to help anything. So anybody know what this is called when you try to figure out the performance benefit you'll get from, uh, from a you know, piece of code based on how often it's used? Amdahl's law, right? So, so Amdahl's law is a basic way for us to calculate. It's a nice little formula that says, if we know what percentage of our, our program is run at a certain time, what, what kind of speed up should we expect? So say that foo does something really, really stupid, and we can rewrite it to be two times faster. So the question is, what should be the expected overall improvement? Right? So in the case of foo, since 60% of our time is spent in it, that 60% of the time would now be cut in half. Right? In the case of the 40% of the time we're spending in bar, it's completely unaffected because we didn't modify this code. So with Amdahl's law, there's this little formula here. You basically plug and chug the percentage of time, the speed up you'll get. Right? This will tell you that the overall speed up you would expect for this example here is that when we make foo run two times faster, uh, because it's only executed 60% of the time, our overall program will be 1.4% faster, or 1.4 times faster. Right? So the idea here of profiling is that we want to figure out where we, we're spending all our time, what kind of optimizations we think we can do to speed it up, and that'll tell us uh, you know, what kind of performance benefit we'll get and, and what, where, where should we target, where should, you know, where should we actually spend our effort. So as I said, having your little hand or you know, a robot, something pause in GDB over and over again is really stupid. Nobody does that. Uh, we have tools to automate this. So the two tools uh, that you can use are Valgrind and Perf. So Valgrind is, is a heavyweight uh, instrumentation framework. So think of it like almost like a, running like a VM. Um, that's basically going to um, record all the, the instructions that your your program is going to execute, and then it's going to be able to give you out give give you give you nice uh, call trace or call graphs to say here's where you're actually spending your time. So Valgrind has a bunch of other stuff uh, I can talk a little bit about, but the nice thing about it is it has nice visualization tools to make to make traversing the, these these reports nice easier. easier. Perf is more lightweight, and the way, way it works is that it relies on the low-level hardware performance counters that the, 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 your CPU provides and the kernel provides to figure out the different events that occur in, in your program. And so this, as far as I know, maybe this has gotten better in, 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 over the years, but they, have a nice, they basically have a console-oriented visualization tool to be able to see this. So with Valgrind, as I said, essentially think of it as like a, Valgrind itself is like a framework that you can then build uh, analysis tools to, to look at other aspects of the system. So the one that we'll be talking about here is, is Callgrind. Uh, you can use memcheck to essentially look for, for, for memory leaks. And then Massif is a way to look at the overall usage of, of memory in your heap uh, over time and get visualizations of like, you know, what, what data structures are you spending, you spending most of your, uh, or using most memory. So to use uh, uh, call grind, uh, you, you basically invoke this command here, and you can see that we can invoke it with any arbitrary binary, 
right? So we can say that we can run your skip list test to test to see you know, where you're just spending time in your skip list, or you can run this on the actual full, full system. And so what will happen is you run this, and then it'll spit out a, uh, a dot call grind file with like, the PID of, of the process that ran. And then you can use a tool like kcashgrind to actually generate a visualization of your, uh, of your program. So it'll look sort of like something like this, right? And so you see on one side, you have the, the distribution time of where the, the, the system spent most, you know, in different, different instructions when it executed your program. And then you have the sort of the call graph structure here to say, you know, what function called what, right? And then you see how many times things are invoked and what percentage of the, of the instructions were actually executed in each function. So for this, you're, uh, and actually what I also like about call grind too is that you can actually get the, um, you can go inside the function and look at the actual lines of the code and see how many times were thing, different parts executed, right? It's, um, it takes getting used to looking at because the, you know, the compiler can sort of reorganize things and rename things a bit. But over time, you, you, learn how to, you learn how to decipher this more easily. So for this, you want to run with debugging symbols turned on because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to, to, to map the, um, in the, the functions back to the source code. Right, and then again, in the call graph view. And you, and you can drill down to each of these and see more information about it. All right, with perf, as I said, basically it relies on hardware counters. Uh, the way X, the user is sort of like this, it's like you pass in how, many, how, how often you want to collect data, what program you want to run, um, and then it will spit out a, a file that you can then load in back in with the perf command and get like a visualization of what it looks like, right? So after you run perf, you collect the data file, and then you run perf report, and then that gives you like a, a console thing like this where it shows you all the different functions where you spend most of your time, and then you can drill down into it and see, and see more about it. Right, so and then this gives you the distribution of where you're spending your time. So, call grind is much more heavyweight than uh, than perf, but, and but call grind is going to be more accurate accurate numbers, right? So perf you could use for like quick and dirty things, um, but call grind if you want to say where I'm actually spending my time, call grind is probably better. But the other thing about perf that's kind of cool is that it could actually record things like uh, the number of cache misses you have, the number of times you mispredict a branch. Right, so you can get a, get a sense of why your program actually might be running slow, um, rather than just where you you spend your instructions. So you need you need both of these things. So uh, there's a lot of different to, uh, tutorials and everything online to say how to use this. I think we have a wiki page that describes how to set this up in Peloton uh, and and run it. But I'll post these slides as well, and you can um, and you you'll be able to you know re run the same instructions on on your skip list and see see how it works. Okay. So any questions about perf or call grind? Who here, who here has used either of those tools before this class? All right, good. Good number of you. Okay, good. Okay. All right, so this is it for indexes. Next class, uh, we're going to now start talking about more of the core storage of the database system. So we're talking about how, to, how you do the different layouts you have to support in your tables, like row store versus column store. Uh, we'll talk about how you, uh, you organize things in memory. And then we'll spend a little time talking about how do you actually maintain the metadata about your, your database in your catalogs. And right? this is the one that I'm, I'm very interested in now because we're building our own, you know, we're expanding our own catalog in our own system. We go look to see how other systems like MySQL do it, and we're like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. We can do it better. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what they do, okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate at a way too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze, at a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it 